2013, my friend and I locked these two guys in an abandoned building. And we didn't let them leave. We were curious about these guys in particular because Ben Coleman and Henry Detweiler are artists. My friend, Courtney Hammond, and I have always been in love with large-scale immersive artwork and the artists who make it. So much so that six years ago, with just 500 bucks each, this is not a lot of money, we started an arts organization called Dashboard. We wanted to create more opportunities for artists to make this kind of work. Opportunities like the one we created for Ben and Henry. Locking them away was an experiment. We wanted to push their buttons, but also push their art practice. We wanted to explore questions like, does a daily routine help or hurt art making? And if all of your daily habits were removed, are you gonna shut down or thrive? We wanted to make them uncomfortable, but we also wanted to give Ben and Henry the very rare gift of time. So for three weeks, Ben and Henry, who had never met before, by the way, <laughs> lived together in this building, a former nightclub in downtown Atlanta. We cleaned it a little. We pulled up carpet. We brought in a couple of mattresses, no box springs. We installed a camping shower, which was like that little dribbly shower for like three weeks, that dribbly shower. Uh, we painted some walls white. <clears throat> we got rid of a lot of rats, both dead and alive. We gave Ben and Henry a prepaid cell phone. It was their only contact to the outside world. It only had our numbers programmed into it and they could only use it for supplies or food. This made us think that we had the upper hand. <laughs> but on the first day, I get a phone call. Hey, Beth, it's us, like so excited. Hey, Beth, it's us. Can you get us one of every paint swatch from Home Depot? <laughs> I'm like, really? One of every paint swatch? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's important. And I'm like, all right. Hey, Beth, it's us. Can you get us some avocados? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I think they're in season. Oh, and red wine, get red wine. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so they had a good time. <laughs> For three weeks, Ben and Henry lived in this place. And on the last day of the third week, we opened the doors to see what they did. Do you want to see what they did? <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> they did this. I know. And they did this. Yeah, okay. they painted. They painted the entire place in this dizzying pattern. They needed the paint swatches. They found two pool tables, a jukebox, and a working Galaga arcade machine in the basement. This place was like a, it was a jackpot. They took the jukebox and they gutted it and reprogrammed it with songs that they created by splicing together sounds from the Galaga machine. At the opening event, people could go up to the jukebox and choose a track, and Ben and Henry would perform something that responded to that track. <laughs> the performances were amazing, and there were 30 different performances that coincided with the songs on the jukebox. The show was on view for three weeks. During that time, we were approached by two young guys who asked what was gonna happen to this building when the show was over. We said we didn't know, but that we would introduce them to the property owner. We did, and these two guys leased the property and turned it into Mammal Gallery. Mammal Gallery is amazing. It supports emerging artists and musicians. It's one of the best venues of its kind in the Southeast. Uh, it has brought economic viability, foot traffic, and national attention to downtown Atlanta, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, and in the past year, two other creative organizations have moved to this area in downtown, turning it into a true arts hub for the city. And all this <laughs> because Ben and Henry spent three weeks in a nightclub making art together. That's pretty amazing, right? Hey. So artistic interventions like these, like Ben and Henry's, have the ability to reimagine our forgotten spaces. They can do this and inspire a sense of possibility in budding entrepreneurs. In fact, 90% of the time when we have a show, 
the property that we use leases immediately afterwards. And it is to this day being run by someone who is local, so it's locally owned and operated. So 90% of the time these buildings are snatched up by local entrepreneurs who are running locally owned and operated businesses out of them. This is a very real ripple effect that art can have. We first became aware of this ripple effect in 2011 when we did a show on Edgewood Avenue in Atlanta. At the time, Edgewood Avenue had tons of vacant spaces. As an art curator, I find working in these kinds of spaces really exciting. They challenge artists to respond to architecture, and they also encourage them to take messy risks that they may not take in a white-walled gallery. On Edgewood, we found five buildings that we really, really loved, and we convinced property owners to let us use them, which is a tricky thing to do. <laughs> and then we hosted a month-long art walk called Ground Floor. For Ground Floor, we chose eight artists, six from Atlanta, one from New York, and one from New Orleans. Here's a piece by Justin Rabideau. We gave Justin a dank basement in a building that literally had not seen the light of day in four years. We opened the doors to this building and just a waft of dust came out. When we went inside, there was a thin film on everything that we saw, but Justin was excited. He was like, I love it here, I love it. So he goes into the basement and somehow had the skill and the vision to turn it into a cozy log cabin installation. He took it and turned it on its head and created something completely opposite of what the space was. Following this show, this particular place was leased by two local gallerists who turned it into a restaurant called Mother. And to this day, all five of the properties we used for ground floor now house locally owned and operated businesses. This is these are local folks who live in a neighborhood feeling empowered by this work to go out and do something and start a business on their own. They're having a very big say in the way that their cities and neighborhoods are being developed. A couple years ago, we started doing more shows outside of Atlanta. Uh, we were invited to Detroit to do a show that would celebrate the city's entrepreneurial spirit, particularly in the art community. Detroit artists are wild. Uh, they make really big, ambitious work. They are mission-driven and resourceful, and they often create more opportunities for each other within their own work. As curators working in vacancy, we were really excited to go to Detroit um, and explore the landscape there. But we knew that we would need to approach that city, which has been through traumatic socioeconomic change with a very profound respect and a lot of humility. Our work has made us keenly aware of gentrification and the way city ecosystems work. With this awareness, we do not just interject ourselves into neighborhoods unannounced. We wait for an invitation and then do the legwork to build authentic relationships and work to preserve a pre-existing cultural identity of a community. Thanks. It's hard. We spent eight months on the ground in Detroit getting to know people, getting to know the city. We shopped locally, stayed locally, and hired locally. Um, we did artist studio visits, we interviewed community members, and of course, we hunted for the perfect building. We found this one. Uh, it was a former pickle factory, <laughs> but, but when we found it, it was full of car parts, boxes and boxes of car parts, and it was owned by a guy named Brad. So we were like, Brad, can you do something about the boxes? So he very kindly cleared them out. Um, and we produced a massive exhibition called Detroit Boom City. It featured 12 artists, eight from Detroit, two from California, one from New York, and our friend Michi Miko from Atlanta. I'm gonna show you a couple things they did. <laughs> this is a piece by Scott Hawking. Uh, Scott makes site-specific installation work, which means he responds to architecture but also likes to tell a story or a history about a place that he works in. For this piece, he scavenged materials from around the building. He grabbed all of Brad's personal items. <laughs> Brad's like, all right, build a shrine for me. 
So he grabs all these materials from around the building and installs them and uh, creates this immersive installation. There were things to ex explore for people. There were books and a gem collection and a record player with records from the 30s and 40s. There were taxidermied fish everywhere. But then you had these giant space age chrome towers and it gave this impression that this place and the person who created it was somehow inaccessible. It was really beautiful and really profound and felt really lonely. It's one of my favorite pieces. Here's another piece. This is a working sauna that the artist Graham White. <laughs> the artist Graham White built this working sauna inside an old Mitsubishi van. It, I think it just lives in his yard now. <laughs> As you can imagine, it was a big hit. People would like get out of their clothes at the opening and put on a tiny towel and <laughs> get in this sauna. <laughs> it's pretty risque. <laughs> Um, this show, there are 10 other installations of this scale for Detroit Boom City. The show was on view for six weeks. We hired local students and trained them as docents to give tours and run gallery hours. Uh, it was a really big hit. It was beloved by the people who lived in the neighborhood and also by art critics in the city. After Detroit Boom City, Brad, the property owner, his daughter took over the pickle factory and turned it into a music venue. To this day, I get monthly emails from Brad. Dear Beth, here's the latest from the pickle factory. It's pretty amazing. So all of this, which started as an idea between two buds to help artists make really big, weird art, has resulted in 42 exhibitions in seven US cities, supporting a network of 125 artists. <laughs> And these are some of the faces that represent that network. I love them. I think I might get choked up. I'm like, I'm so glad they're here with me on this stage. Where are they, like, where have they been? These artists have had such an impact. Um, they have the ability to reimagine the way that we experience our shared environments. I have seen their work transform space in a way that inspires people to have vision and take action. I think the work at our shows teaches people to see art in a new way. It is active and alive and in our streets. The artists that we've worked with whew, have had a vital economic impact on the cities they work in while connecting, each other, while connecting people to each other and to place and while preserving a cultural identity of a community. This is not easy work. Artists are often underpaid and the arts are not well-funded. But the value of art and its ripple effects are measurable and are immense. These artists who have taught me that when we create together, we inspire each other to do and dream really big. And I'm so grateful. For that, I will support them my whole life and I hope that you will join me. Thank you.